Hey, welcome along to Life Switch Online. It's so good to have you with us today. I hope you've had a really, really good week. As always here at Life Switch Online, can you do me one big favor? Just say hi in the comments below. Um, we'd really love to help you just, just get connected with other people because, hey, we know everything's better when you're connected with others. Hey, and one other thing before we dive into our margin series today is just simply this. Did you know that we've got an incredible prayer team up here at Life Switch? And uh, they, they, they pray um, over so many different things. But one, one way that they pray is, is people put forward prayer requests and, and these get filtered out to that prayer team. And, and then they start praying over it. And I was just reminded about this this week because we've seen some incredible prayer requests come in in the last sort of seven to ten days. And man, our, our prayer team have gone above and beyond praying for them, these things. And, and I don't know what's going on in your world right now, but can I just suggest to you, hey, if you have got a prayer request that you'd like other people to be praying with you, why don't you send that through? Uh, you, you can do a message on, on here right now, um, or you can find another way to get it into us. But I'll tell you what, if you get that message through, we have a team of people that would love to join you in praying for whatever it is you're praying for. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm so stoked that I know that there's people around me, that when I've got something going on in my world that I can just reach out to and know that I'm not the only one carrying, that I've got others that are lifting that up before God. And, and what we are told um, in the book of James, right, is that our prayers are powerful and they're effective. And so just imagine what that looks like when there's a group of people praying around something. So, hey, if you've got any prayer requests, please let us know because we'd love to be able to pass those on to some of our people and have them praying right alongside you. All right, part three of our margin series. And, and as we've been going through this series, the big question underlying it is this, is our attempt to get the most out of life causing us to lose our joy for life? Is, is us trying to squash so much into life, something into every minute, some, something always got something else on the go, is that causing us to lose our peace, our joy, and our purpose in life? And the way we've been talking about margin is really this, the space between our current pace and our limits. And in week one, we, we did a deep dive into this idea of margin and, and how really looked at the fact that, hey, this is how God wants us to live our life. And in week two last week, we looked at our time and how we schedule things and saying, hey, what would it look like for us to create margin in our schedules? Because when it comes to our schedules, when it comes to our finances, when it comes to relationships, this is how we tend to live, right? Trying to squash everything into it. And what would it look like to live with a little bit of margin in there? And we've also got this website, lifeswitch.org.nz slash margin. And if you go to that website uh, now, you'll actually see that some more resources have been added to that about what we're going to be talking about today. There's ones from last week where there's some resources to help us with our time and with scheduling and that sort of thing. Hey, and as today, we really look at creating relational margin. We've created a couple of tools and some further resources you can um, find if you go to that website. But the principle I, I want to... Just, just lean on today is simply this, that our joy in life is determined by the health of our relationships. Your joy, my joy in life is largely determined by the health of our relationships. If our relationships are really healthy, we tend to be a lot happier. When our relationships are strained, when the relationships might be fractured or even broken, we tend to be going through a lot more difficulties in life. And what we kind of know somewhere in here to be true is that our joy in life is determined by the health of our relationships. And a lot of us have this idea, if I could just be on holiday here, if I could just have a lifestyle that looked like that, then I would be happy. Or we think, if I just had this much in the bank account, or I had just had these level of positions, I'd be happy. But, but the truth is, our joy really comes from the health of our relationships. That's why you can travel the world and you can see people who, who are living very much hand to mouth, who have got absolutely nothing, and yet they have got smiles on their faces and there is a lot of joy in their life because they have healthy relationships. And that's why you can see other people that from the outside have it all. They look good, they've got heaps of money, they've got those flash houses in the Hollywood Hills, but their relationships are strained and broken. And when we see them turn into substances, into all this other stuff to, to try and get some joy because 
that they thought or we think, if I had what they had, I'd be happy. But the reality is, people that are living their life that haven't got healthy relationships, they quickly discover that that joy isn't found in having the right address and having the big house or having all of this stuff. That our joy really comes and it's determined by the health of our relationships. So we go back to this picture. Is this what a lot of us try and do relationally? Do we try and squash all of our relationships, every person, into one big circle? I'm going to be friends with him. I'm going to be friends with her. I'm going to try and pull them in. I'm going to be polite. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to bring everyone in to the circle because if, if I really want to win relationally, I've got to get everyone in the circle and I've got to have everyone like me. And the more people I can get in there, the better my relationships are going to be because because if I try to get them in, maybe they're going to be my best friends. Maybe they'll be my spouse one day. Maybe they'll be the people that, that I, I go through life super close with. And I don't want to miss anyone. So I want to try and squash everyone in. And how many of us are living a life that looks a little bit like this? Relation, we're just trying to squash everyone in. We haven't got time for anyone. But we've got everyone squashed in. <laughs> let, me, let me put it to you one more time. Our joy in life is determined by the health of our relationships. Given we know that to be true, is it, is it interesting that we find this written in the book of Proverbs? That the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Righteous, people who are good is really what, what uh, the author of Proverbs was saying. When he talks about righteous, he was saying, hey, those that are living a good life, what do they do? They choose their friends carefully. In a book that came out earlier this year, it was actually came out of um, Harvard University, printed this, and, and it's lessons from the world's longest scientific study of happiness. This test, um, this experiment, they've tracked people now for over 75 years in order to determine what it was that made people happy. And, and they've been reporting on this um, for o- over the years, but this book just sort of came out at the start of 20. 23. And this is one of their findings. I'll go through a few, few quotes from their books. What makes a life fulfilling and meaningful? The simple but surprising answer is, we've already covered this, relationships. It continues. The stronger our relationships, the more likely we are to live happy, satisfying, and overall healthier lives. Exactly what we've been saying, right? In fact, the Harvard study of adult development reveals that the strength of our connections with others can predict the health of both our bodies and our brains as we go through life. This study that has had some of the best minds working on it now for decades, when they've got to this place to conclude what is the one fundamental thing that that brings joy to life, they determine that it is relationships here look at this. this this is cool this is cool later on in the book they say the people who were most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest mentally and physically at age 80. they're saying there's a correlation here between not only how happy you are but how long you live based on your relationships if you've got good connections you are going to live a happier healthier longer life and you're going to be more mentally with it. Why? Because you've got friends. Now some of you might be freaking out because you're 50 or maybe you're past 50 and you're going, oh no, what can I do? Well, hey, we can always build friendships. Some of us are below that age at the moment and so that, that you, you know how long you've got. You might have a year. You might have a decade. You might have three decades until you reach 50. But I just love that, that as they've followed these people and track life, they've really said the people who were the most satisfied in their relationships well, those who had the healthiest relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. That's why Solomon would say that we want to choose our friends carefully. Why? Because if we're going to have healthy relationships, you want to choose the right people to have healthy relationships with. Unfortunately, there are some people that tend to really make any relationship they go into unhealthy. And if we're going to have healthy relationships, we want to be flanking friendships with healthy people. Now I just want us to change track for a moment. I want us just to switch gears because we've laid the foundation here, right? 
that our, our relationships are what bring us happiness. If we've got healthy relationships, we're happy. If we've got unhealthy relationships, we are unhappy. And what I want to do is I want to pivot and I want us to look for a moment at the life of Jesus. Because, hey, for those of us who are Christians, he is the one we follow. He is the one who founded our faith, who established our faith. He is the one who claimed to be the Son of God, who made the prediction that he was going to die and rise again. And then he, in fact, pulled that off. So we, we follow him. And one of the things Jesus said is this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I had it put to me that, that as churches, what we often do is we spend a lot of time talking about the truth. We want to get to the truth. What's true? But if we really want to live the abundant life that Jesus said that we can live, what we've got to do is this. We've got to walk in his ways and know his truth, and then we'll experience the life. What we want to do is we, we don't want to just look at what Jesus said, but we want to look at how he lived. When we look at how he lived, we can get principles that we can copy, not because of what he said, but because of how he lived. We want to look at what he did, and when we see what he did, and we embrace that in our own life, and we couple that with the truth that he teaches, we will be able to live the life that he offers. And what I want us to do for a moment is just take a quick pick, a quick image of Jesus's relational world because Jesus's relational world is is quite special and it's quite unique but I think there's something powerful about it you see Jesus he had three close friends he had three people that were closest to him he had Peter he had James and he had John none of these three people are are known all over Christendom that if you talk to any um, New Testament scholar they'll tell you that these are the three people that were closest to to Jesus. I'd call them the key three. These were the people that they journey with and came to closest to Jesus. They really were Jesus's inner circle. Uh, these, these three saw things that others didn't see. These three experienced things that others didn't experience. These three were brought in and I believe they saw Jesus in, in moments of his as absolute best that others missed. And I also believe they saw moments in Jesus' life where he was really, really struggling that others missed. Let me explain why. That they were the only three that went up the mountain when the transfiguration occurred. And we can read about that in Matthew 17, Mark 9, or in Luke 9. That these, these same three, they were, they were taken in and they saw the raising of the daughter of, of Jairus when Jesus raised this daughter, this girl, from the dead. And we can read about that in Mark 5. And we can read about that in Luke 8. So, so, so really high moments. But also, as Jesus was about to be executed, when he knew his betrayal was coming, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he took his disciples and he took three of them a little bit further into the garden with him. Who were those three? It was Peter, James, and John. They saw Jesus when he was struggling with knowing what was to come, praying just as intently as he possibly could. These three got a closer view. They saw the best and the worst of him. That is what it means. Jesus, he had these three really, really close friends. And then what do we see with Jesus? We then saw that he had his 12. We saw that he had the 12 disciples. Peter, James, and John, they are a subset of that 12. So there was those three and there were nine others. That Jesus had this, this, this crew around him of 12 people. And yes, these 12 people saw Jesus a whole lot closer than anyone else. These 12, and, and Jesus, they really did life together. They, they followed Jesus. They knew most of what was going on. They, they had, a, had a very close-knit relationship, a very tight relationship between Jesus and the wider 12, although he just had these three that he had a slightly closer relationship with. And then if we go a little bit deeper, we look a little bit further, we'd say, hey, well, well there were 120 in the upper room praying and together after Jesus had ascended to the Father. These 120 were those who believed Jesus was who he said he was. These 120 that were there when the the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, the room, there was 120 people in it. I'd say these 120, they were Jesus' 
friends. Did they know Jesus well? Yes, they knew him well enough to, to say that he was the son of God. Did they know him as well as the 12? No, no, they didn't. They didn't have the same experience. They, they didn't go on all the tours that the 12 went. They didn't share all the meals that the 12 did with Jesus, but they were still Jesus's friend. And then on the outside, we've, we've got the crowd. Because what we see when we read through the life of Jesus is, is there was crowds that always followed him. Everywhere he went, there was crowds around. There were, there were, there were people. He had, he had walked down the street and, and there'd be people along the sidelines. Remember, we talked about this earlier when we did the, um, the memoir series. Bartimaeus is, is, is part of the crowd, the blind man, as Jesus walks by. Where we had um, Zacchaeus who climbed the tree as Jesus Walked by, there was, there was a crowd. Everywhere Jesus went, there was crowds. And if we look at Jesus' relational life, I really think we can say, hey, there was Peter, James, and John. Then there was the 12 disciples. Then there was the 120 in the upper room. And then outside of this, there was the crowd. And what's important to note here is this. Because as we start to talk about this, and you can kind of see where, where I'm going with this, one of our pushbacks is be, but I've got to treat all people the same. If I'm going to love people, I've got to treat people the same. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus loved everyone equally, yet he treated everyone differently. Jesus loved every person equally, yet he treated people differently. You just, just, just think about it for a moment. Well, when blind Bartimaeus got healed, he was sitting there with a blind friend. Bartimaeus got healed, but his friend didn't. Well, when, when Jesus went to the pool of Bethsheba and then he, he, he saw that, that there were people were waiting there, those that, that, that were crippled, those that couldn't help themselves, we were placed around this pool, hoping to be healed by getting to the water. First, Jesus came and he healed one man and he said, get up, take your mat and walk. And then he healed one, but there were a whole lot of other people there. Did Jesus love all of these people? Yes, he did, but he only healed one. When he, when he saw um, Levi sitting in his tax collector's booth, were there other people around? Yes, there was, but Jesus went to Levi and said, hey, you come follow me. When, when Peter and that were fishing, were there other people around? You bet there were, but who did Jesus go to? He went to them. Why? Jesus loved everyone equally, yet he treated people differently. When Jesus called into Mary and Martha's house for lunch, were there other houses he could have called into? Yes. Did Jesus love all of those people? Yes, but he treated them differently. He went to Mary and Martha's house for lunch. He didn't go to Barb and Barbara's house for lunch, right? He, he, he went to Mary and Martha's. Jesus loved everyone equally, yet he treated everyone differently. And because and you can see where this is going, let's just be reminded here, this is, this is what Solomon told us, right? Right at the start, we looked at this. The righteous choose their friends carefully. The righteous choose their friends carefully. And so what I want to do is, I just want to take a few moments now to show you a, a suggested way to look at your relational life. I want you to, 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 to remember how Jesus lived and, and how his, the, his ways were, because he said, I am the way. Let's look at the way that he outlined and he lived his relational life and say, hey, how does this apply to me? I'd suggest it applies like this. Jesus had his key three. He had his key three. Have you? Have you got a key three? Have you got three people that you can say, man, these friends know me better than others. These three are my inner core. These are my key three people. And I think what's important here is, is that it is the number three. A lot of us might have that key person, that key one. But the, the problem with that really is, is this thing called codependency. See, if, if, if I've only got one close friend, I'm putting a lot of weight on their shoulders. And that can actually lead to an unhealthy relationship. Some people say, well, I've, I've got a spouse. I have to have a key one. Yes, that spouse should be in here 100%. But I'll tell you what, and your spouse can thank me for this, you actually need some other friends in there too because your spouse can't carry you on their own. They just can't do it. Yes, they'll support you. Yes, they'll love you. But I'll tell you what, you'll be better and your spouse will be better if there's a few more people 
in here. You, you think of something that, that you want to be that, to be stable, right? If, if something's stable and it's only got one support structure, that thing has got a lot more chance of falling over. But if there's two, that's a little better. If there's three, it's even stronger. What we want to do is we want to build a relational life that's stronger than one relationship. Because what if that one person moves away? What if that one friendship you've had, they come and say, hey, well, actually, we're moving to the other side of the world. You would be left devastated and to be in a huge vacuum in your life because you've only had one person in this inner circle. What if, what if there, there, there's something that person is trying to help you see because maybe you lack self-awareness and we've all got blind spots. That's why they're called blind spots because we can't see them. And then we keep pushing back, pushing back, pushing back. If we had another person or another person in there that we could go and reflect on that with, maybe we'd have a lot higher chance of us actually seeing a blind spot. Well, what if you've got one person here, you can then get jealous if they actually start to have a relational world that's bigger than just you. Because you're saying, man, all my relational world's with you, but you've got a relational world that's with them. Something's going wrong here. I need, you know, this it gets yucky and icky. We need a relational world that's bigger than a person. We need to have a key three. So, so let me just ask you this question. Can you identify three people that would fit in this circle? That, that might see the absolute best of you, but might also see you at the absolute hardest points of your life. Just as like when Jesus was crying out in prayer, Father, take this cup from me. Please take this cup from me. Have you got friends that can see you crying out, those agonizing, those difficult prayers? That's what your key three come in to do. This next group, I'll just call it your crew, 12 close friends. Your key three are part of this crew. But have you got 12 close friends? The way that, um, that I've heard this described is that this almost needs to be your sympathy circle. That this is people, this circle is made up of 12 people that if any of them were to die, you would be absolutely heartbroken. You would be left devastated if something was to happen. Can you think of, 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 you know, maybe a key three and then nine others that would fit into that circle? You see, just like Jesus and his disciples, they, they knew a lot about each other. This crew's going to know a lot about you and you're going to know a lot about them. You're going to have a, have a very special, very tight relationship. It's not quite going to be as intimate as the key three, but it's still going to be very, very close. And then we go out and we go, hey, well, actually, have we got room for, we've got room for about, about 120 friends. Again, this is people whose name you're going to know. You want to know their spouse's name. You want to know their children's names. But we've got room. We've got capacity to, to have friends to about this sort of level. These are the sort of people that if you saw them, you'd be more than comfortable enough to, to, to sit at a cafe and have a coffee with them and have a chat, to, to have a drink at the bar with them and sit down and continue on conversation that, that we've got capacity um, for about 120 people. And what's really interesting about this is we see this modeled in Jesus's life, but there was actually a, um, an anthropologist whose name was Robin Dunbar. And, and, and Dunbar, well, what, what he did was he, he, he looked and analyzed people's brain and he analyzed the brains of various different types of animals. And in particular, he looked at what's called the neocortex part of the brains. And, and, and he did this over a range of species. And what he did was he identified a formula using a ratio that shows the maximum expected group um, size of that animal based on the size of the neocortex in their brain. And he just mapped that out and said, as the neocortex got bigger, the bigger the relation, the bigger the, the group of animals that would hang out. And when he did this for humans, these, interestingly enough, are essentially the numbers that he identified. He said that most people can have three to five really close relationships. They can have about 10 to 15 that would sit in here and then somewhere from 120 to 150 in this circle, which just blows me away because that's exactly what we see replicated in the way that Jesus lived his life. He had his key three, he had his crew, he had his friends, and then he had the crowd. And what we've got to understand is 
when it comes to your life, when it comes to my life. And there's a lot of people that really are the crowd. And then you've got to, again, we've got to understand when, when people are in this friend zone, there's a lot of different stages and levels of relationship in here. But there's also a whole lot of people that we just have to be okay with being in the crowd. And what your tendency and what my tendency tends to be is we want to squash everyone into this. And, and because we try and squash everyone into it, we often find we don't have many friends in here or even here because we're trying to bring too much of the crowd in here. We don't have that unhurried, unstructured time to build those intimate relationships that help people move into this space. In this space. You see, to get to people to this level, and in particular to get people to this level, there, there requires that time that's unhurried, that's unstructured, where we're just hanging, we just relationships are being built stronger and stronger, where we're chewing the fat, we're having conversations, where we're just doing what people do, but, but we're not like, man, I've got half an hour for you, and I've got to get to my next appointment. Then we're, we're going to have breakfast, but I've got to be out the door by 8 o'clock, okay? That's not how you cultivate these intimate, vulnerable, important types of relationships. And what we do is, because we don't have any boundaries around this, we start to let that crowd come in and that becomes wider. And then all of a sudden we realize, man, there's a whole lot of people whose names we know. But there's not a lot of depth to much of those relationships. And what we saw Jesus model for us and the way that he lived was, man, he prioritized the three. He prioritized the disciples. He obviously spent close to more time with the 12, 120. But then there was a whole lot of people, a whole lot of people that made up the crowd. Let's, let's, let's look at it this way. When it comes to how we prioritize our friendships, this is what we see Jesus do. He prioritized the three. Then he prioritized the twelve. Then it was his friends. And then it was the crowd. And I'll tell you, we unpacked this so well in that series. We did, and you can find that at the link, that life search dash margin one. Um, called Marble Jar. And, 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 and what I do in week, I think it's week three of that, we, we had a message called the allure of the crowd. And that talks about why we're so attracted to the crowd. Why, why we so want to appear, um, why we so want to please the crowd. But also the cost that comes with that. Because when we, when we look at like social media and what that's done to our society, what that's done is it's told us to prioritize this, right? Well, let's prioritize this, and then we'll get to that, and we'll get to that, and then if we're lucky, we'll get there. Because we want everyone to like us. But John Maxwell, an, an incredible, prolific author, he, he says this. He says, my definition of success is that those who know me the best love me the most. My, he's defining success not by what the crowd thinks of him or even by what his friends think of him, but, but hey, those who know me the best, they love me the most. That I don't want to look good to please the crowd. No, 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 I want to be the real deal because I want those who know me the best to actually love me the most. And I think, man, what an incredible definition of success. And so what we have to do if we're going to see this play out in our life, what we have to do is like what Jesus did, we have to prioritize the three, then the 12, then the 120, and then the crowd. And remember, a lot of friendships are, are, are seasonal, right? Whether that, just because someone's in your three now, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be in your three in 10 years' time. Some of them might be lifetime friendships. That's incredible. That's cool. But, but, but friendships are fluid, right? They're changing. We grow. People grow. We change. Others change. To that, You can't be like, this is what it's going to be like forever because life happens. People change. You, you go closer. You grow apart. You go closer. You grow apart. I really struggled with that closer, didn't I? But we've got our three. And we've got our 12. Then we've got our 120. And then what we want to do, I think, is get into a habit of just bringing it up from time to time. Who are my three? Am I prioritizing them? Who are my 12? Am I prioritizing them? Okay, have I been a bit smarter and saying, hey, these are my real friends and these people are the crowd? Because the reality is you've got some people in your workplace that you're trying to bring into this category, but they actually belong over here. Honestly, we've got, we've got people in, in our church context, right? And then when we, when we know that, that, and the scriptures tell us that, that we are known by the way that we love one another. So we're going to think, if anyone's part of the crowd at church, don't they have to be in here? Well, look, remember what Jesus did? He loved 
everyone equally, yet he treated people differently. There's some people in church that you can actually leave in the crowd because you haven't got the relational capacity to bring everyone in here. And if you try and bring all of these people into here, you're going to miss out on what these have to offer. And what is it that's really going to make you happy in life? Remember what we said? Our joy in life is determined by the health of our relationship. That if, 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 we're, if we're prioritizing the crowd, we're not going to have healthy relationships. So our joy is going to be diminished. But if we can say, okay, and again, you never say to someone, hey, no, no I haven't got time for you because you, you're just the crowd. Like that, that's not loving people at all, right? But, but we've, we've got to be mindful of the fact that we can't and have room and we haven't got capacity. We haven't got relational bandwidth to look after and care for and be friends with everyone. So what are we going to do? We're going to do what Solomon says. The righteous choose their friends carefully. We're going to be intentional. We're going to say, these are my three. This is my 12. These are my friends. They are the crowd. We're not going to be rude to the crowd. We're not going to look down on the crowd. We're not going to abuse the crowd. We're not going to hate the crowd. No, 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 no. We're just going to embrace our limits. We're going, to, we're going to create margin in our relational life. Because if I create margin in my relational life, I'm going to have that unhurried, that unstructured time, that, that time of importance with these people. And when I can create that unstructured, unhurried time, do you know what? These people are going to see me at my best, and they're going to see me when I'm most depressed. They're going to see me when, when I'm at my highest point, and they're going to see me when I'm crying out to God because I don't know what to do, and I feel like everything's out of my control. But you see, I'm never going to build that type of relationship unless I've got that margin in my relational bandwidth. What I've got to do, what you've got to do, We've got to be intentional about this because, listen, listen, listen. The crowd, the crowd, they can suck all of our bandwidth so easily. And, and we've got to remember what Jesus did. Because Jesus loved everyone equally. He treated people differently. If we want to live the life that Jesus died for us to live, we, we can't simply know the truth, but we've also got to embrace his ways. Let's look at how Jesus lived. Let's embrace his ways. Let's know the truth and we'll find ourselves living the life. Now, this isn't easy. This is really, really difficult. But what we've got to do is, is we've got to push back from the allure of the crowd so we can focus on the relationships that matter most. Because our joy in life, your joy in life, is determined by the health of your relationships. So as we wrap up, a little evaluation time. A little evaluation time. Some questions for you to ponder. Here's the first one. Ask yourself this, am I overdoing things relationally and preventing myself from friending well? Am I stretched? Is my bandwidth, my relational bandwidth so stretched that I'm preventing myself from friending well, from having the time to be with those people, from being able to help them when they need my help? Or maybe, this is a better question for you, am I underdoing things relationally and missing out on meaningful relationships? Have I narrowed my relational bandwidth so much because I'm so preoccupied with other areas of life? Am I underdoing things relationally? Maybe that's where you're at today. Two more questions. Who do I need to become more available to? Who do I need to become more available to? Who do I need to create that space so I can have that unhurried time with? This, this might be a spouse. This might be a parent. This might be some of your kids. But it could also be that friend that you haven't seen since you left university. It could be that friend that you were so close with, but because of circumstances, and maybe the fact that, that, that they move cities or you move cities, you haven't got the same time with them anymore, but you know that you need to be more available to them because that friendship brought so much life to you. And although you can't hang out with them the same way you used to, you can still become more 
available to. But maybe you look around and you know that there's some people around you that you, you think, man, oh, I could be a great friend with him. Oh, I could be a great friend with her. We could be so much closer, but I just haven't got the relational bandwidth at the moment. I haven't created it. Hey, who is it that you need to become more available to? And then, then the final one, who do I need to limit my time with? Who is it when we look at the chart and we go, man, those people really are in the crowd, but I'm giving them the time that I should be giving one of my 12. There's something wrong with this. You might look at them and go, man, oh, they're, man they're, they, there's something about their, their, their level of maybe honesty, the way that they conduct themselves, the way that they treat others. And you're like, man, that's not someone I want to be close with. But for whatever reason, maybe because you work with them or because they're your neighbor or because your kids have got friends with one another, you're spending a lot of time with them, but you're realizing that's not the sort of person I want in my inner circle. Who do you need to limit your time with? Who is it that you're bringing in or has found their way in but really should be out in the crowd? Remember, every time you bring someone in, by saying yes once, you're saying no to a whole lot of other people. See, a lot of us, when we think, say no to your heart, say no to your heart, I say no, man, that's, that's, that's a really bad thing. But every time you say no to one person, you're saying no to one person. But every time you say yes to one person, you're saying no to a whole lot of people. So who do you need to limit? Who you're spending your time with? I, I hope this has been helpful. I hope that, that, that in some ways I've scratched an itch. I've, I've, I've set you up to maybe do some thinking about this because I'll, I'll tell you what, because I think in here you know this to be true. I know this to be true. That, that, that our joy really is determined by the health of our relationships. So let's get our relationships right. Let me pray for you because, man, I really do believe so much in the power of prayer, and then I'll let you go. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, every person listening to this. I thank you so much that, that as we read the accounts of Jesus' life, we, can't, we don't have to simply focus on what it was that Jesus said, but we can learn so much from how he just carried our life, from what it was that he did. And Father, I pray for all of us in this relational space that you'll help us to submit to you in the way that you call us to. I pray that you would help every single one of us to, to look at the way Jesus lived his life relationally and, and embrace that as a model for us to live by. And Father, I know that, that as we talk about this, it lands so differently for so many people. Because Father, there are people that have been just so burnt relationally, they don't think they could ever bring someone in. And Father, for those people, oh, I pray healing. Father, other people look at us and go, I've got so much going on in my life, I just don't have room for any friends. Father, I pray you'd, you'd just give them that, that, that deep-seated core conviction that their happiness is tied to their relationships, not to their status, not to their income, not to their possessions, not to where they're living, but really it's the relationships and the health of our relationships that bring us joy. Father, I know there's people right here, maybe they've just struggled relationally. They've, they've struggled to build friendships. They've struggled to build connection. And maybe it they, they just feels like, man, rejection is, is so real. Father, I just pray that you'll help them to know that they are so loved by you. That you, while others might have rejected them, you would never, ever do so. And Father, I pray that you'd give them the courage to keep going. To, to lean into and to find these friendships and to find these relationships because... Man, those are so life-giving. And Father, I, I, I know that there's so many people watching this and, and they've got some incredible friendships. And so, Father, I pray you'll just help them to continue to water the right soil, to see those relationships flourish so that they can live a life full of the joy that you want them to experience. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. Hey, again, thank you so much for joining us. You have a great week ahead, and we'll see you back here for next week as we continue with our Margin Series. Hey, and remember, next Sunday is Mother's Day, so if you haven't got your mother a gift yet, now's the time to start thinking about it. Don't leave it till next Sunday. And if you get really stuck next Sunday, though, hey, bring her along up here to Life Switch because we're going to have a gift for every single mother. We'll see you next Sunday. Bye.